Our second reading today is also from the book of Acts. This time turning to Acts chapter 14. And there we'll read verses 8 through 18. Let's listen again for the word of God. In Lystra there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Thus far in God's word, may he bless it to our hearing and to our living. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Some of you probably recognize the name James Holtzauer. That's the guy who's been on Jeopardy winning ridiculous amounts of money. If you uh, watch Jeopardy at all, you would have seen him up till a week ago because it's been the teacher tournament this past week and next week, and then James will be back again to break the bank some more over at Jeopardy. Well, anyway, I thought since Jeopardy has been in the news a little bit, let's start today with a Jeopardy-style answer. This 1938 Philo T. Farnsworth invention forever changed the relationship between pastors and congregations. I heard it. What is television? $200 to somebody out there. <laughs> what is television? Television changed just about everything for churches and their pastors. Before the invention of TV, ministers didn't have to worry nearly as much about being entertaining, amusing, personable, or attractive. Congregations at that time had been raised on reading and radio still had attention spans that were longer than about the typical 10 minutes between commercial breaks on TV. And I don't think we should underestimate how much TV encouraged people to get out of the habit of participating in church activities, especially during the week. For many years, my mother could be found in front of the TV from one to three o'clock every day watching her stories. <laughs> and I myself remember begging my parents to let me stay home on Wednesday nights to watch Lost in Space <laughs> rather than going to catechism classes at church. The most significant change, however, from the perspective of the pastor was that TV changed the congregation's expectations about his or her performance. In the same way that some TV actors have a really great Q score and a personality that can drive the ratings for a TV program, it became the settled opinion, if unspoken opinion, of many that the pastor was solely responsible for driving the ratings of a church. As an interim minister, I have served in four churches which fired their pastors. They didn't call it that, of course, but that's what it was. 
In one case, it was justified on moral grounds, but in the other three congregations, when you blew away the smoke and peeled away the onion layers and dug to the bottom of the bovine fertilizer, <laughs> what you found was that each of these churches had fired their pastors because he or she wasn't getting good enough ratings. The congregations didn't feel entertained enough or stirred enough or just didn't feel enough warm fuzzies. And if the church wasn't growing by leaps and bounds, well, that was just one more bit of evidence that the pastor wasn't likable enough. And so he or she had to go. I'm bringing this all to your attention today, not only because the narrative lectionary has brought us to this passage in the book of Acts, where the crowd wanted to elevate Paul and Barnabas to the status of a Greek god, a description that, alas, no one has ever used when talking about me, <laughs> but also because the pastoral search team, our pastoral search team, is wrapping up their work, and they will very soon be making an announcement about a candidate they'll be recommending a candidate to our council, someone to become the next senior pastor of the People's Church. Like me, he or she will not be a Greek god or goddess or any other kind of deity. He or she, like me and like Paul and Barnabas, will simply be a human messenger whom God is sending to the People's Church to share the good news. In the verses that we read from the beginning of Acts 13, we are reminded that the choice of a spiritual leader for any particular ministry is up to God. That's God's doing. There were several ministry candidates in Antioch, prophets and teachers, many of whom were named for us in that passage. And as the church was worshiping and praying, the text says, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. This is something that our pastoral search team has thought about and talked about often. The search process in a calling congregation, which includes congregations in the United Church of Christ, in the Presbyterian Church, and in the American Baptist Church, we are calling congregations. The process is unlike the search for executive leadership in any kind of secular organization. In the secular world, you put together a job description of all the characteristics you want in your pastor, all the qualifications, and not pastor, your executive. You put together that job description, and then you collect applications and resumes, and you try to find the person whose qualifications most nearly match your job requirements. More to it than that, of course, but that's the gist of it. You put together your list, you check the candidate's list, find one who matches. But in a pastoral search, we do things differently. Now, we do some of that listing of requirements. We have a job description. We have a list of minimum qualifications. But the question that our search team asks repeatedly as they review candidates is whether they see evidence that the Holy Spirit has put a particular candidate in front of the team. Now, an ascending church, like the United Methodist Church, the other of our four denominations, the leadership, it's the leadership of the region and the denomination who listen for and watch for signs of the Spirit, a spirit the Spirit directing a candidate to a particular ministry. Well, early in our process, members of our search team asked me how they would know if the Spirit was indicating a particular candidate. How would they know that a particular candidate had been sent by the Spirit? And my answer to them was, as it has been in all the other churches I've served as an interim, I said, I can't tell you how you'll know, but you will know. The Spirit will make it clear to you, and you will know. Now, for example, in one of my previous churches, there was a candidate who the search team was trying to avoid. This candidate's name had come to the team by way of a member in the congregation. Somebody had recommended that they look at this candidate. And when the search team did a little research, they discovered that this candidate had lost his ordination two years earlier because of an inappropriate relationship with a member of the congregation. And so the search team chose to set his name aside. 
But then that same name came in front of them again, this time by way of a denominational executive out in California where this particular candidate was living. And the search team set it aside again. And then it came in front of them a third time, this time from a local denominational leader. Hey, have you considered this particular person? Well, after the third time, the chairperson of that search team suggested that the team should schedule a phone interview with this candidate. You know, just doing due diligence and all that. Nobody was particularly excited, but they agreed that they would do that. Now, you have to know that in this congregation at that time, they were saying farewell to their founding pastor. I had come as the interim when their founding pastor retired. He had done a marvelous job with that church. He was well-loved. And this was kind of an artsy church. And so as part of his farewell celebration, they were building an Ebenezer monument. Ebenezer comes from the Old Testament book of Samuel, 1 Samuel 7. Here I raise my Ebenezer. And Ebenezer is a monument which says, thus far the Lord has brought us. Thus far have we come. And so if you, if you Google Ebenezer monument uh, and look at the images, you'll see some modern, some old and some modern versions of churches that have done Ebenezer monuments. So anyway, back to that candidate in that phone interview. I don't normally sit in on interviews. But the chairperson had asked me to stay in the room this time just to listen for any red flag kind of moments. And the interview, the phone call went really, really well. The candidate was honest and remorseful about what had happened two years previously. He talked openly about all the steps that he and his wife had taken to be restored in their relationship. He spoke about how his relationship with his colleagues and how the church had been restored and eventually the denomination had decided that he could be reordained and he was ready to receive a new call. Well, as the phone call was wrapping up, somebody just sort of casually asked him, well, what have you been doing in the meantime? What, what have you been, how have you been active in the church you're attending? And he said, well, I'm not sure if you'll know what this is, but we've been working on an Ebenezer monument. Everybody on that search team, they just looked at each other around the room. And uh, when they got off the phone call, they decided, well, maybe we should watch one of this candidate's sermons, which they did, and it was just excellent. He was a marvelous preacher. They flew out to California. The team flew out to California to meet him in person, to meet his wife, to talk in person to the denominational leaders. And then they called him to be their next pastor. And he just retired last year after 12 years with that church. Very, very fruitful ministry, 12 years with that congregation. So at any rate, the Spirit has all kinds of ways of letting us know that this is the person I'm sending you. In the verses that we read from Acts 14, we see what happened to Paul and Barnabas when they got to Lystra. As they were speaking, Paul saw a man who had been lame from birth and saw that this man had faith to be healed. And again, we don't know how the Spirit let Paul know that, but Paul knew that this man had faith to be healed. The NIV that we read says that Paul called out, but that's really not nearly a good enough translation. The Greek says, the Greek text says that Paul spoke with a megalophone. You can hear the word megaphone in there. Megalophone, which means a great voice. He spoke with a great voice, and what he said, Paul said, was to stand up. And there again, the word in the Greek is so rich. It's a version of the same word that is used in the Greek to describe the risen Christ. So if you go to the Greek Orthodox Church on Easter, you say, Christos Anesti. Christ is risen. Anesti means risen. And here Paul said, Anestathy which is a version of that same word. It means rise up. He told this man to be resurrected, and it really was a resurrection moment for this man. If you were lame, could not walk in that day and age, you were as good as dead. His lameness had made him as good as dead, and Paul told him to rise up, and he leapt to his feet as if jumping out of a grave. The text then tells us that the people of Lystra, speaking in Lyconian, decided that Paul and Barnabas were the Greek gods, Zeus and Hermes, come down to earth. And Paul and Barnabas apparently did not understand Lyconian, didn't know that this was what was being said. And then in the meantime, the local priest of Zeus was sending bulls and wreaths. They wanted to offer a great sacrifice with the crowd by the city gates. And that, in a nutshell, is what many contemporary congregations are looking for in their pastors. 
They want their pastors to be miracle workers who can raise as good as dead church members to new life and to resurrect as good as dead churches to new life. They want them to be entertaining and amusing and just challenging enough. And in at least one church that I served, they want them to be tall. <laughs> A woman at that church, Lee will attest to this, I swear to God, a woman at her church came up to me after the service one Sunday, and she said, Pastor Case, I just wish you were taller. <laughs> this is it. I could stand on a box, but... Paul and Barnabas weren't having it. When they finally understood what was happening and what was being, they said, they said friends, why are you doing this? We, too, are only human, like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Could it be that Paul and Barnabas are also telling us to turn from worthless things, things like charisma and influence and physical appearance, and instead focus on the message of the good news itself and how all of us can be people who share it with others who need to hear it. Let me close with just one last note from the Greek text. Paul and Barnabas were not going to allow the people of Lystra to treat them like Greek gods come down to earth. And instead, they told the people about the God who made the heavens and the earth the God who gave them rain and crops in their season. And then they said that it was this God who filled their hearts with euphrosunes. And if you hear the word euphoria in there, you're hearing it right, euphrosunes. It's not the messenger who fills our hearts with joy. That would only be a fleeting pleasure. Rather, it is God and God's message of hope that fills our hearts with the kind of joy that lasts now and for eternity. Amen.